The whole rifle was one of the very first military arms to be manufactured from interchangeable parts. But it is not just the production method implemented in the rifle works of the Harper's Ferry Arsenal by John Hancock Hall that made it special. It was a breech-loading flintlock rifle in the age of the smoothbore flintlock muzzle-loading muskets. This rifle fired faster and more accurately than anything in the US Army in the 1820s and 30s. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Ball here, your favorite gun channel in beautiful bright English language and today I have a very special arm for you today that's an icon of the firearms history. This is the model 1819 Hall breech loading flintlock rifle. This is a straightforward arm and it tells a lot about the early history of the interchangeable manufacturing of firearms. Follow me, let's learn the history of this rifle, let's learn its impact and let's shoot it a lot. But before we continue, let me thank you for your support. Your donations through Patreon are vital for keeping the quality of the channel high. Remember that on Patreon and also on History of Weapons and War platform, you receive exclusive content. So if you support me, you get more of Captain Ball. What can be better? So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again. John Hancock Hall, the inventor of this tip-up breech rifle. It has a tip-up breech. You can see that you can open the breech of the rifle to be loaded, but from the direction of the muzzle, so not with a cartridge from the direction of the breach. So John Hancock Hall was born in Maine in 1781 and he was taught to become a cooper sometimes. He lost his father at the age of 13 and at the age of 22 he enrolled to the Light Infantry of Portland where he gathered some valuable information about using rifled firearms for military service. In 1811 he notified the President of the United States, James Madison, that he has a state-of-the-art breech loading design. Well, by that time, the breech loading flintlock rifle was not a new invention. For example, the British army already tested one made by Der Seg. But also, the Austrian army had his own version, designed by Giuseppe Crespi and Ambrolia Gorla, and they were in service. So, the design was not new, but in fact, this kind of concept was straightforward a new concept. The Crespi breech loading flintlock carbine entered service in 1770. 2,000 pieces were ordered for the light cavalry of the Habsburg monarchy. It was a traditional side-lock firearm, but the chamber could be opened upwards to accept a paper cartridge. It was withdrawn from service just at the beginning of the French wars. So the president directed him to the secretary of war, and the secretary of war directed him to the superintendent of the patents, William Thornton. Well, but Thornton rejected to issue a patent to Hall because he said that he already had that kind of design in mind, he brought the idea from Europe. He did not have any kind of drawing, of course, but he wanted a share from the profit. Thornton insisted to his statement that he brought the tip-up breech arm from Great Britain and it was made by Mortimer in London that was presented to the Secretary of Navy in 1809. He even declared that he was the inventor of this type of breech and did not receive any reward for his novelty. Hall was not in favor of sharing the earnings but could not overcome such great pressure so agreed to include Thornton in the patent. So Hall actually was forced into a contract with Thornton that said that they, he would receive 50% from the income and his job was to find, let's say, contractors for manufacturing the rifle while Hall had the right to establish a factory for manufacturing his guns. Their relationship was full of conflict, so up until 1820, let's say the appearance of the really large-scale manufactured Hall rifles, Thornton was one of the greatest enemies of the breech loading concept for the US Army. Hall described his invention in the following way in his patent. That which forms the breech rises at its forend upon touching a spring or by any other method which may be found more convenient. The charge is then put into the receiver without ramrod, taking care to press the ball or shot to the powder with the finger. By this construction of the gun, it may be loaded in less time and with less trouble than is necessary in loading common guns. 
Hoss first breech holding rifles had a bronze receiver or bronze breech block and the hammer was on the right side of this receiver. But of course it's had to be redesigned, this had to be strengthened for military use because he was aiming the military contracts with his rifle. So by 1814 he already had the steel breech block and the, and the hammer and the frison moved into the center, nearly in the center of the breech block. He had the first official ordnance test of this rifle. And it was successful, so he immediately received a 200-piece order from the government. But in fact, by that time, he had a gun shop in Portland, but he lacked the proper uh, capacity for manufacturing that kind of quality, uh, quantity. And he was planning to make much more rifles, so he needed investments to, uh, to, to improve his workshop and to expand his workshop. He was hoping for a 1,000-piece order from the government, so he rejected the first one. Hall's first rifles were not made with interchangeable parts, but in 1816 he already had it in mind to produce everything in his workshop from interchangeable parts. Well, for that he really, really needed that 1,000-piece military order. But in fact, the chief of ordnance only ordered 100 pieces. But now, in 1816, he started to manufacture these 100 pieces. These are my first trials with the rifle. I rolled some paper cartridges that proved to be a bit tight for the chamber. The powder charge was 80 grains of 2S Swiss powder and a 527-528 lead round ball. I primed the rifle from an external flask to save all the powder from the cartridge for the charge. In my later trials, I changed to a thinner paper and a different type of rolling cartridges.
Oh, that's a really sweet rifle, ladies and gentlemen. One, two, three, four shots. Let's say in the size of a little bigger than the 10 ring. This is the first load, so I did not fine tune it. It's just 80 grains of 2F3 powder plus a 5-3-0 round ball, lead round ball in paper patching lubricated with tallow and beeswax. And I have a flyer here that was an awfully slow ignition, but otherwise it's good. It is good at 50 meters for the first time. This is good. This is excellent. But don't forget that the cartridges were used with the complete powder charge, so I primed it from an external primer just to not lose gas pressure there. <laughs> I love that. The cost of these rifles was 25 US dollars per piece. Hall knew that he has to convince the decision makers that he can seal perfectly the beach between the barrel and the receiver. Well, we know that if you don't have a metallic cartridge here loaded into the breech that can expand on gas pressure and seal completely the breech of the rifle, this is impossible. This was impossible in case of the whole rifle as well, but actually Hall in 1816 redesigned the system. He added two iron bars here and here on the sides of the receiver and the receiver receives two shoulders. So these iron bars actually push the receiver face forward. It, he was a machinist, he was a clever guy, and he made very, very smooth and flat surfaces between the barrel breech and the face of the receiver, which means that even today on my rifle, it is not possible to put a single paper sheet in between the breech and the face. So this is not a perfect seal, you will lose some gas pressure, but it is quite good. It is quite very, very good. Hall was confident in his rifle. He knew that it works because even with the bronze receiver versions he was able to fire many thousand shots without significantly increasing the gap between the barrel and the breech. For example, there was one rifle that was shot 3500 times, which is much more than the service time for a rifle like this. He was a clever guy, so he knew that when you're firing the rifle too rapidly, it will overheat and if it's heating, the metal will expand. So for example, the axis of this of this uh, breech piece has an oval hole, which allows the complete system to expand backwards, which will allow easy opening and closing even if the rifle is folded or overheated. In 1816 he wrote instructions for his rifles, and the first part of this instruction tells us what are the benefits of these breech loading guns compared to the normal muzzle loaders. Well, first of all he said that the rate of the fire is more than double than in case of muzzle loaders, and it is true, I can prove that. Second, he said that this rifle can be loaded easily in any position, sitting, kneeling, prone, or even it can be loaded easily on horseback. The best thing about the breech loader is that it is convenient to shoot in multiply positions, like kneeling. You don't have to raise above your cover which can be very, very useful. But it's a flintlock. You can also do this in the prone position quite easily. Much easier than any case of muscle loaders. <laughs> I'm too old for this. But there were other benefits as well. 
He said that you can fire more than 50 shots with this rifle without cleaning it. And this is a great improvement because on the cartridge, on the ball, there were no lubrication. Just think about how many shots you can fire with your muzzle loading rifle if you don't lubricate your patches. Not too much, but with this rifle you could fire 50 shots without any problem, and this was a great improvement. He also said that the cleaning of the rifle is very easy, because you can remove the breech piece anytime. It's just one screw here. You unscrew this little axis, and there you go. You can remove it completely, and you can see through the complete barrel and clean it. And when you were cleaning the bore, it did not matter if it gets wet. If you just wipe the breech out and it's dry, then your powder won't be spoiled. Which is also a very good thing compared to the muzzle loader, because if you don't ride the bore of a muzzle loader, you won't be able to charge the powder, because it is going to get damp. He said that the vertical vent hole, which is here on the top of the breech piece, just under the frizzen, is also an advantage, because if it's on the side, you will burn the soldier that is standing to the right of you. And with this rifle, this can never happen. And it actually won't burn your face as well, because uh, it is just 10-15 centimeters from your face when you're firing it. So it's not that disturbing. The first 100 rifles featured all the improvements Hall made in 1815-1816. These rifles followed the style of the American long rifles. They were equipped with brass patch boxes, trigger guards. They featured the wooden ramrod and the barrel band secured with springs. The bridge was marked with the US letters and the script John Hall Patent. The barrels were octagonal, but the last 5.5 inches from the muzzle was turned round to accept the socket bayonet. So the first 100 rifles were shipped to the Charleston Arsenal, and the acceptance was very good. Deputy Chief of Ordnance, John Morton, said the following about the rifle. I cannot sufficiently praise them. Everything, except the bayonets, is as perfect as can be wished. I am decidedly on the opinion that they ought and most eventually supersede the common rifle. The common rifles, they were the muzzle-loading rifles, flintlock muzzle-loading rifles that the light infantry used by that time. But even if the first 100 batch was successful and further trials proved the reliability and the good quality of the whole gun, the 1000-piece order did not come. The government had something in mind. They invited him to Harper's Ferry to set up a rifle manufacturing store, a rifle works, and to be the superintendent of this rifle works. He would receive from that point one US dollars after each whole rifle produced in the factory in the official state on the arsenal and also a 60 US dollar monthly salary. And Hall finally accepted this. So the large scale production finally started and in the meantime Hall started to modernize the workshop, the rifle workshop at the Harper's Ferry Arsenal. But the government was still skeptic, so in 1826 they sent a committee to check whether the interchangeable manufacturing is working or not. So this committee they tested the guns again, of course, but they disassembled a hundred guns and reassembled them from mixed parts. And it worked. It was inter interchangeable. Parallel to this inspection, new trials were carried out with the rifle. One single model 1819 whole rifle was fired more than 8,700 times without any malfunctions. Now, this is good. With these trials, it was proved that the whole rifle is actually more accurate and has a larger rate of fire compared to any muzzle-loading rifles or muskets in the army by that time. That was a great improvement. The committee was fully satisfied, so they immediately placed an order for 5,000 guns. That was later in 1828 increased to 9,000. That was finally a good quantity for Hall and a great success, of course. The cost of a Hall rifle in the 1820s was 16.68 US dollars. Well, in 1828, a new company was involved in the manufacturing of these rifles. It was Simon North's company factory in Middletown. Well, Simon North was also a great advocate for interchangeability, and he had a very modern workshop, by the way. But the first deliveries were not so good. So Hall understood that he had to supervise that production as well, but he did it a professional way. He made gauges for North, and with those gauges, the quality increased strongly, which means that the interchangeability between the Harper's Ferry made and the North made firearms, whole rifles, was also proved. The total production of whole rifles were around 19,000 in Harper's Ferry, adding another 3,190 pieces with percussion locks. This was the model 1841 percussion rifle, whole rifle, of course. And also, North manufactured around 5,700 pieces, so that was the total, total production of the whole flint or breech holding rifles. Interchangeability is a very important aspect of making firearms, so making anything today. 
This means that each and every single part is interchangeable with a part from another rifle, from another product, which means that the logistics will be much more easier because you don't have to send uh, gunsmiths to any infantry battalion, but it is enough just to spend spare parts and the soldier can change it if there is a need for a change. Well, this idea did not originate from the United States. Actually, it was invented in the Enlightenment, in the time of Enlightenment, by French military officers. Most of them are artillerists, like Griboval, who was modernizing the production of the artillery pieces of the French army during the Ancien Regime. Or we can also say Guibert, Jacques-Antoine Hippolyte de Guibert, who was, uh, who was planning to manufacture muskets, the 1777 muskets from interchangeable parts. He had a good partner in this. He was a gunsmith in Paris. He was called Honoré Blanc, who designed the lock for the 1777 muskets. But in fact, it was not really possible by that time because the mechanization level of these gunshots was very low. So, which means that everybody, everything had to be, or mainly everything had to be done with handwork. So the key idea behind interchangeability is making the parts on machines, mechanization. The key persons behind this were Eli Whitney, Simon North, and of course, John Hancock Hall. These machines, they were powered by steam engines or more commonly by water. So this is why all the arsenals and all the manufacturing plants, they had to be close to flowing water because that was the key source of energy. And uh, let's not forget that machines like the eccentric turning machine of Thomas Blanchard or the first milling machine in the United States that was used by Simon North's company, that they were key elements in making these guns from interchangeable parts. During the long production time of the whole rifles, there were minor alterations on the rifle uh, in between the contracts, but in fact these alterations did not really affect the complete operation or work of the gun or accuracy or rate of fire, so they were really minor modifications. But let's check them. The first and second contract rifles were identical. The first 1000 rifles were delivered in 1824, and the second thousand was also approved by the summer. These rifles were much more military designs than the previous ones. They had iron ramrods, and they followed the line of the military muskets. A unique feature of these rifles is a stopper on the hammer that is only present on these pieces. This was eliminated on the second contract rifles. The third contract rifles manufactured from 1832 featured all the improvements for the first two contracts, but Hall changed the way the barrel bands were secured. Instead of the springs, he used pins to secure to save some cost. Hall also added protectors to the receivers of the third production rifles. These newly added steel blocks eased the hard recoil of the breech piece. The size of the gas ports of the frame were also enlarged. My whole rifle was manufactured in 1839 in the Harper's Ferry Arsenal, so it is truly a third contract model. Many of these rifles were converted to percussion before the Civil War, and they are not easy to find in such great condition. This rifle is mint. All its parts are original and fully functional. The rifle stock is strengthened at the receiver. The wood is thicker and has the form of a boat. And the internals are reinforced with metal sheets so the gases escaping at the breech cannot harm the wood. The receiver is easy to remove. Only one screw holds it in place. The mouth of the chamber has a diameter of 0.545 inches and the internal smaller diameter powder chamber accepts 75 to 80 grains of powder depending on the corn size. The two steel bars, or the chokers as Hall called them, are removable and replaceable. So if the gases burn out the joint of the chamber and the breech and the gap increases, after smoothening the face of the receiver with adding a larger choker, the gap could be closed again. The first one and a quarter inch part of the muzzle is countersunk to save the most important part of the rifling. The bore is rifled with 16 grooves with really slow, one turn in 110 inch twist rate. I slug the bore 
and the length to length diameter is 0.512 inches, while the groove to groove diameter is 0.535 inches, meaning that the 525 round ball is oversized, so the rifling will definitely grip it. A really interesting feature of the rifle is that the trigger pull is adjustable, proving that accuracy was really important when designing the rifle. The trigger guard has a semi-pistol grip, offering a very comfortable hold. As the hammer and the frizzon are on the top right of the receiver, both the rear side and the front side are offset to the left. The rear side is dovetailed, so it is adjustable horizontally. The large vent hose on both sides direct the gases escaping at the joint of the breech and the receiver forward, so they never harm the shooter. This is clearly visible on slow motion clips. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the first part of the whole video. The next part will focus on recreating the original ballistics and the tactical use. If you are searching for more information about early military rifles, please visit patreon.com slash cap and ball. Here the top two tier supporters can access several papers written about early military rifles. The whole rifle itself is already covered in two documents featuring more than 40 pages of information based on mainly primary sources. There are also several articles that cover the history of the early British military rifles, like their first Germanic Jäger rifles, the Ferguson breech-loading rifle, or the famous Baker rifles of the Napoleonic era. So ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Until next time, stay cool and keep your powder dry.